All right, guys, in today's video, we're going to be breaking down what I've learned after taking thousands of sales calls, uh, spending thousands upon thousands of hours obsessively researching, studying, and getting better at the craft of sales. I'm going to be sharing that with you today. This is inclusive of my five years experience of actually doing this from 18, 19 to 23, 24, somewhere within that age range, okay? So... Before we dive in, I'm going to give you an explanation of the background that's behind me. You guys might be curious, you might not be. Um, you might care, you might not. So if you don't, feel free to skip through like the next one or two minutes. I'm just going to give a brief little blurb and context as to why I'm here. So uh, as you can see, amazing setup, a super cool room. If you want the tour of the place, I put it on my Instagram on like the world story or like the highlight story that I have there for you guys. But the reason I'm here is I actually have now moved into uh, a resort with my friend, a really close friend of mine. And the reason why this is so special and the reason why this is such a big thing for me is when I came to Dubai from Australia, I officially moved from Australia to Dubai around January, February, uh, sometime this year, which I don't know how many months ago that was, right? Eight, nine, 10 months ago, something like that. But... Now is the 8th of October, and when I came here, I saw that my, my close friend was actually living at this resort, and I was amazed. I was just shocked that this lifestyle was even possible, that you could live in a place like this with all the hotel amenities and all that type of stuff, and it really is a beautiful place. And I set a goal at the beginning of the year that I wanted to move into a place like this, if it's not this one, something similar, but... I've now officially moved here, which is honestly insane to say. Um, my friend actually lives just across the hallway, which is uh, pretty crazy. And the place is really awesome, especially as compared to the little studio that I was living in and working in the past you know, four or five months now. God, the, the days go by pretty quickly. But um, yeah, it's super exciting to be here. It was a big goal that I had at the beginning of the year. So you guys will probably see this backdrop uh, quite often more frequently. I might give you guys a quick tour when I travel to go see my friend play in Amsterdam. I think I travel there on the 18th, so I might do a vlog going there. Um, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Uh, but you guys will probably see this backdrop a little bit more often uh, considering I've actually moved here and lived here now, or living here now. So personal updates aside, let's jump into the guts and the meats of the content. So... Again, recap, this is what I've learned after five years experience and thousands of sales calls of actually working in the career that majority of you watching this video probably want to get into or are currently doing right now. Tip number one or lesson number one is that discovery is equally as important as objection handling. Before I launch straight into it, I want to preface with this context. What has served me extremely well in sales as a career and high ticket sales as an industry, like that corner of the market, the e-learning education space, is that to sell from principle and to learn from principle and not from technique and the next trendy flash in the pan strategy that's now trendy and in style in the market, right? There's a lot of stuff that's going around. Uh, sell without a script, put the price at the top of the sales call within the first three minutes. Um, only focus on objection handling, right? There is a lot of confusion in the sales space going on right now. I know probably how that feels because I am 23 now, turning 24 in November. But when I got in this space, I was 18, 19. And so I was young and impressionable once at a point in time. And just understand that it always comes back to principles. Don't focus on the techniques but focus on what works for you and what is actually efficient, right? Don't get stuck on the new thing that's trendy or flashy or super cool because a lot of people are getting stuck on that right now. So why is discovery equally as important as objection handling? The reason I note this is because this is one of the most recent things that I'm seeing going on right now in the industry and the market, which is that people are prioritizing objection handling over discovery. Understand that they are both equally weighted. You can't have one without the other. Yes, you need to be prepared for objections when they do come, but you also need to have a good discovery so you don't get any objections at all or you can do your objection handling correctly. 
I see a lot of current clients and past clients and people that I come across, again, with the trend, riding on the trend that objection handling is the most important thing. You need to equally both uh, weight both parties because otherwise the gap in the prospect's mind is not further enough for them to change. I'm gonna give you a, a good example of one of my mentors. One of my mentors sold fitness for a very long time, I think 10 plus years. And he got extremely good at sales, but he was stressed out, burned out, and not making the money that he wanted, even though he was good, but he was only good at one thing, which was objection handling, and his discovery sucked. And so I took this lesson from him, and I prioritized discovery first, and then objection handling afterwards. In fact, I did really well just prioritizing discovery. I closed around, I think it was... 40% at the start, and then it moves to 60% consistently on a business opportunity offer. Consistently, for a year straight, just prioritized discovery, and I got better at objection handling later, okay? So I just want you to understand that you need to equally weight both and not just prioritize one or the other because one's not going to save you, right? I also had a client recently who messaged me this morning going, I'm going into an interview, and I'm good at discovery, but I suck at objection handling. What can I do? I'm like, there is nothing that you can do. You need to focus on training both and prepare because you're going to this interview underprepared. Anyways, that's the main key first point. Understand that you need to equally judge both and you need to become good at both skills, not just one, okay? Um, next thing is ask more questions, use less statements. And I'm gonna lead this point with uh, two quotes, which is one of my mentors said to me that, encapsulates this point extremely well and efficiently, which is that what you say is trash and what the prospect says is gospel. Another quote by Dale Carnegie, which is that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. I'm going to break both of these down for you. When I say, and again, I didn't invent this, I got this from a mentor, but what you say is trash, what the prospect says is gospel. Too many salespeople prioritize convincing people something of something in turn in, instead of internal persuasion, right? Which internal persuasion is so much more influential than external, right? If I tell you something, you're not going to take it on board. I want you to think about it in this case and scenario. How many times has a close friend of yours or your parents or somebody else tried to convince you of something and then you completely reject the idea? right? More than you can probably count. The reason why is because you trust your own thoughts and not others. And that's why you want to think of a sales call as a sales dialogue where you want to be asking most of the questions as opposed to telling them the way they need to be doing things, right? Again, the way the prospect is going to be inspired to change and make a difference is if they, they think the idea is their own, right? Understand that we cannot, in sales, we cannot force someone to say yes, but we can make it incredibly difficult to say no, right? So this is what we must be focused on. If you have a statement in your script, if you have a statement in your sales process, turn it into a question, period, right? Stop trying to convince your prospects of something and in, instead let them convince themselves. I want to just run this point home with one last example. If you ever think about politics, I don't watch politics, I don't care about politics, but American politics is pretty entertaining across the board, right? A lot of, a lot of the world watches it because it's, it's very entertaining. And when you look at both political parties that are going against each other, when has one ever gone, yep, okay, let me just go to your side, right? I don't even know the, the names of the left or right or whatever it is. I've never seen one person be convinced of the other's opinion or perspective, right? Because again, what you're saying is trash and what they tell themselves is gospel. So you have to really clearly understand in that case and scenario, the way you get people to unravel their argument is ask them questions that make them tell themselves why their idea is very stupid, right? Sounds a little bit condescending, but that's exactly the way that you do it. Right In debates, the reason most people don't win debates is because they're stating factual statements, but they're not asking questions to get the, the prospect or the person to unravel their ideas, their thoughts, their goals, their limiting beliefs, Right, which is your whole job as a salesperson 
which is to get someone out of their own way. Next thing, objection handling is broken down into two things, structure and not running out of things to say. Let me break this down for you. So the reason most salespeople will run out of stamina or lose an objection handling is because of it always comes back down to those two things. You can say that you need this fancy reframe, you need this blah, 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 blah. Again, there's a lot of noise in the market. I want to simplify it for you. It just comes down to those two very simple things. When you're objection handling, this is the way that I do it and I teach my clients to do so and it seems to be pretty successful so far. Again, I didn't invent this. I didn't invent sales. I learned it from mentors, but this is what works best for me. Structurally, you always handle money first, right? You always go funding aside, is this something that you would do? And then you always go for a, uh, a tie down towards a solution. So why do you feel like it is, right? You always go for a tie down to a solution. You always go money logistical, you always go partner, and then you always go think about it, right? I could cover the whole thing here now, but that's gonna make this video way too long. Money, partner, think about it. When you understand the structure of objection handling, then it comes to the point where you just simply run out of gas and you don't know what to say. Objection handling is about being efficient. It's about a brilliant understanding of language is the best way I can put it. And before I kind of move on to the next point, I want to add to this. You can become extremely good at objection handling if you remain calm. Where a lot of salespeople really cook objection handling and really mess things up is they try to pressure somebody into something. They... Um, they get frustrated, they get angry, they get confused. They, there's a lot of emotions you can feel when there's a couple hundred dollars to a thousand dollars in commissions on the line. I understand that, I get that, I've been in that position. But what I've constantly been complimented on by other sales trainers and other people that you may look up to or may have seen in the space is that I remain really calm and neutral and I stay detached from the sale and the prospect can feel that. The moment that the prospect senses that you are frustrated, angry, too keen, and you have what is called commission breath, you are going to land yourself into some trouble and you're going to get the person to give you every excuse in the book. Uh, I've got to go calm the dog down. I've got to go to the dentist. I've got to, I've got to go pick up my wife. I've heard it all. I've seen it all. Again, I've taken thousands and thousands of sales calls, so I've just seen it from the rest of it. So coming back to the main thing, nail down the structure, and then figure out your reframes. What do you say when someone wants to think about it? What is the specific fears that they have, right? Is it fear of you, right? Do they not trust you? Uh, is it something they've been burned in the past before? Is it something they've never done before? What I suggest to all my clients and what I suggest to you is construct reframes that are specific to the actual person's objection so that you can be more efficient and again, Back to what I said before about objection handling being a brilliant understanding of language. If we can understand and hear for what the objection actually is, we can get to the result much faster and we can also make more sales. So we can we can do another video on objection handling if you guys want to you know, maybe comment down below if you want to see more objection handling stuff. But that's where I'll leave it for now. I don't want to make this video way too long. Um Next thing is making your presentation 10% of the call. So I'm not sure if I've already mentioned this video or not, but I had a client recently who came to me and he showed me one of his sales calls and uh, he had, I think it was like 10 to 15 minutes of discovery and then he went straight to demo and presentation and he was wondering why he wasn't closing so much. And I was like, dude, there's so much we can fix. This is actually a really good thing. What I learned from one of my mentors, again, I'm not taking credit for these things. This is, just what I've sh this is what I've learned and this is what I want to share with you, is that you want, like the building rapport with a prospect is not involving uh, how your product shapes up to the competitors or this, or the, f the, the, the bells and the whistles, all the flashy things, right? That stuff doesn't matter. Discovery should be 90% of your sales call and your presentation should be 10%. Your pitching should be 10%. That should be it. 
very rarely on a sales call should you be telling people stuff. You should be asking questions and better understanding their scenario uh, more clearly, as I mentioned earlier on the video, okay? So, super simple. Chuck out the boring pitch decks, chuck out the boring demos, chuck out all the type of stuff. Keep it super simple. Condenser deliverables into three to five pillars maximum and keep it clear, keep it simple and keep it tailored to what they've already told you and said that they wanted in an ideal solution. Keep it simple. And then the last thing is productive versus interesting conversation. I'm trying to keep this condensed. This video could be hours upon hours long, <laughs> but I'm trying to keep it short. Productive versus interesting conversation. What do I mean there? So this is where the classic problem of uh, p salespeople having way too long calls than they should be. Um, you know, I'm talking like if your call is longer than an hour, you're doing it wrong. Hour, hour and 10, hour and 20, hour and 30 plus, you're doing something wrong. My sales calls uh, typically, RSA is kind of different, but for uh, other offers, when I got good, I mean, really good. I could go from, hey, what's up, hello, to meeting a stranger, to having five to $10,000, $30,000 paid within about 30 to 35 minutes, and the call's finished from there, right? A lot of salespeople think that in a sales call, what they're talking to the prospect about is um, productive conversation, but it's actually interesting. How do we find the difference between the two so we can shorten our call times and make more sales? How we differentiate between the two very clearly is mapping out in your sales process the objectives that you're trying to achieve in the sales call and then bridging off uh, when you ask your questions, the only answers you are looking for are the objectives that you've already mapped out in your given sales process. Super simple, I know, but trust me, it works. A lot of people on sales calls, uh, you know, view me as pushy, as aggressive, but I like to think of myself as like a steamroller in this case and scenario, where I, I push people down the process because again, hearing about the prospects weekend or about their negative experience six months ago that's totally unrelated to the sales conversation at hand is not productive to you and is not productive to them. So what I suggest to do is focus on more productive conversation as opposed to interesting. This is where I see a lot of sales reps go wrong a lot of the time and their sales calls end up blowing out hour, hour and a half. I've even seen two hours as a regular timestamp for a sales call. Crazy, I know, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how someone can do that for two hours, my head would probably blow off. But anyways, those are the key points and those are the main lessons that I want to share with you so you can help shortcut your journey with learning a skill, getting better faster and uh, being successful with making money online with high ticket sales, of course. So hopefully you enjoyed that. If you want help with this, if you want to shortcut this even further, this video is the tiniest fraction of a glimpse of one one hundredth of what I know. Uh, if I sat here and told you everything that I knew, we would be here for hours. So if you want to get more help and you want to streamline this process and you want to get better at sales, you want to, you're serious about this career, you really want to take this on board, you think after hearing this stuff, this could be you, uh, well, there is a link down below in the description to fill out a quick type form. Take you about three to five minutes to see uh, if you can work with me or my team. Um, it'll most likely be with one of my team members or it might be with myself, who knows? You might get lucky, you might speak to me. Um, but for now, uh, fill an application if you think you're a fit and that's pretty much it for me, guys. So hopefully you're having a fantastic week, a fantastic day whenever you're watching this. And yeah, see you guys in the next one.